y'all, it's Andrew Reed with Monster Creek Mushrooms, and today I just wanted to go over another short video in our contamination series. Uh, more specifically, uh, I wanted to speak about bacterial blotch. I know we covered a little bit in that fruit fly episode, uh, but I wanted to go over bacterial blotch in specific, because even if you don't have flies, you can still see bacterial blotch. Uh, there are other vectors for it uh, to be carried. So, something else to note is that Bacteria will stunt your mushroom's growth, so it's pretty easy to see. It's a yellowish-brown color, um, kind of orangey. They, it'll often get slimy, or the mushrooms will look shriveled, and they'll even look dried, but when you touch them, they're flexible and soft and pliant, and you know that they've not dried out. Before I do, though, this little lovely is on its third flush. But before I do, this little lovely is on its third flush. And, uh, this should be up on the website by the time this video comes out. That's house, um, the house mountain oyster. And I believe, based on a comment that I got on Instagram when I did a post about it, that that is, what is it, Pleurotus cornucopiae, copiae? I don't remember how to pronounce the end, but the branched oyster. I'm not entirely sure about that. I have not had it sequenced, but it does act a lot like it. And if you remember, I did my first flush pictures of our video of this in the series about how mushrooms look when they are starved for fresh air um, which does happen more often in the summertime and if you remember I had other oysters to show as well but this mushroom right here third flush I was just gonna put this in cold storage and never bring it back out except maybe for some breeding um, people on Instagram really <laughs> responded to this oyster and Samantha has put her foot down and said that uh, this, this mushroom stays so, the reason why is because it reminds her of anoki mushrooms with a nice long stem, and I'll take some b-roll for you, and a beautiful cap that opens up once it hits, um, I don't know, whatever it's branching process, whatever that ends, it just caps out really nicely. She likes it because it's got these thin, very edible, very well textured stems, and the caps that come out and are delicate, much like anoki mushrooms. So, I was tempted to call it the Anoki Oyster. We're not, so call it the House Mountain Oyster. But I just wanted to let you guys know that that was available for uh, liquid culture sales for anybody who was interested in it. Uh, honestly, we're gonna add it to the breeding um, program and see if we can't force it a little bit more. This thing has yielded crazy fast and has produced a lot of mushrooms and has filled a box way better than most of our Anoki has. And so we might start growing it in place of Anoki, especially since it's growing well, you know, as you can see, in this heat. All right, speaking of heat, let's go back to blotch. Bacterial blotch, and I have B-roll galore to show you right now because it is affecting mainly Elm Z. And the reason why it's affecting mainly Elm Z, I believe, is because it is a fat-bottomed oyster, right? It has got a, a fat stem on it. It's that very thick, very soft-textured stem that I have noticed in the King Blue and other uh, and other large stemmed oysters that seem to be mostly affected by bacterial blotch before other ones will. Um, our Elm Z crop is not doing super well right this moment. Um, and here are the reasons why I think, and we'll just go over the vectors really quickly. Uh, I picked this spot, number one, for this. This is a major, your humidity system is a major vector for bacterial blotch. Especially if you're using using misting systems, anything that's gonna spray water out in the air is going to be <laughs> dangerous. I used to think that the House of Hydro would be a little safer for that. Uh, it's not. I still prefer House of Hydro um, over the others. I still prefer the atomizing misting systems, the sonic humidifiers. They just do a much better job, I feel like. They're easier to work with, they're easier to clean than the pipes with the nozzles and all that kind of stuff. And those things work as well, I don't mean to down on any of you guys using those. This is just what I prefer. And boy, it's leaving a lot of humidity on me. I feel like I can't sweat. Um, but the sonic humidifiers, they vibrate at a certain frequency that atomizes the water. Hence this beautiful, beautiful, sweet, sweet house of hydro fog, as I've said before. Uh, and. What you don't realize is that bacteria, if you have it in your reservoir, is also being atomized. It is being carried on this humidity, and therefore it can be spread through the room. 
there, there are people that use actual pesticide treatments using these foggers because they can atomize the pesticide and carry it through a room. I don't necessarily suggest doing that. I don't necessarily suggest not doing that. I have no experience with that. But I will say that blotch will travel through this. That's why it's so important to keep your humidifier reservoir clean and the pipes at the elevator and everything as clean as possible. That's why we clean weekly uh, through the summertime, sometimes twice, and everything gets uh, cleaned with soap and water and then gets bleached down and then gets rinsed out and then gets um, put back together and allowed to be refilled with fresh water. Uh, another thing that we do is we keep a UV light in our reservoir that helps to keep bacterial growth down. You will still get growth on uh, surfaces and in the water column that are shaded from the light. So if you have a light right here and it's shining that way and you've got you know the rim of your humidifier going around, the backside can grow. So it's best to try to place it in an area in the central spot where that, that UV light can get every surface possible. I know that it can't necessarily get everything, but it will at least help keep your water clean. Now, another vector is of course the fruit fly. The fruit fly is the great spreader because bacterial blotch, from what I've seen, tends to go from surface to surface contact. It doesn't normally travel through the air. We do create an air, the ability to air travel using the humidifier, but other than that, um, that's really more of a waterborne travel than it is. Like, think mucus, like if someone sneezes, usually you're not getting virus in the air, you're picking up mucus droplets <laughs> with virus in it. It's kind of the same thing here. Um, which is why it's going to be surface to surface contact. Flies, which we put these these nice little uh, pine resin, um, just ra raid fly ribbons in here. We also have some, uh, we'll go into like cattle barns, big patches that you can stick on blocks or whatever that you know uh, may be harboring flies. And those things pick up, every time a fly lands, it, it uh, stops right there, which is what I like. Keeps them from crawling around. That said, the best way to get rid of flies is to, once you harvest your mushrooms, you wanna go through and pick off any little straggler bits, right? Any little bits of mushroom that were left behind, like these right here. Um, Jack and Tristan, you're in trouble tomorrow. <laughs> but the uh, pick off any little bits like that, because if they stay, they will continue to rot. Bacteria will grow on them. Flies will come to them, walk around, and then in fact, I've got some video of a cluster that was kind of left on there that should have been pulled and has lots of flies on it. That is a super spreading event, right? That's a super spreader right there. It's, it's pulling all the flies, attracting to them, and then when you are looking at perfectly healthy mushrooms, you'll sometimes see a fruit fly walking around, and most likely that thing has already been to visit the bacterial fields, and now is spreading bacterial endospores and bacteria itself all over your mushrooms. You don't want that. You want to use fly traps galore, uh, wine uh, vinegar traps with a little bit of a uh, drop of like Dawn dish soap in them. Those have worked effectively for us. These have probably been the most effective thing we use, the raid strips. Um, but that's that's really it. I mean, you just want to kind of, you want to keep your room clean. Drying it out helps. Bacteria need needs moisture to survive. And if you can dry out your room, you're gonna have a lot less environmental conditions that help those mushrooms, or those help, helps that bacteria along um, and spreading to, it keeps it from spreading to your mushrooms. It also limits the flies' ability. They like to get in moist spaces. That's why they get inside your blocks. Um, that's why I kinda, we try to keep our floors as dry as possible. You wanna make sure that you're, you're limiting the environment, the breeding ground for flies. If you see a block that has larva in it, that block needs to be removed and taken out. Um, I wish I'd gotten some shots earlier. Tristan just took out a few blocks of comb tooth that had the black death, and those things need to be just taken out as quickly as possible. Another vector for this is poor handling practices. If I'm coming through here, for example, and I'm picking mushrooms, and let's say that we have some, and I go, oh, look at that, there's, there's some contamination right there, some bacterial blotch. Bam, I, I pick that up, and I throw it away, and we're done. That was actually not bacterial blotch, but just an example. And then I go, oh, hey, uh, Samantha, look at this beautiful mushroom. Look at this. Like, oh, man, don't you see it? Oh, look how I touch it. Oh. And then you come in tomorrow. Why is that mushroom gross? 
Why is it spreading everywhere? Because you didn't change your gloves. After you freaking touch the back. This is what gloves are for. Gloves are not to hold on to things all day. You don't work in your gloves all day. You want to make sure that you're changing your gloves. You touch something contaminated, then you take the glove off. You take it off from the base, fold it in over itself, and take it off. And what that does is that keeps you from cross-contaminating surfaces. Hee <laughs> hee! Because the one glove. Anyways. <clears throat> I'm funnier in my head. I promise. Poor handling practices also include how you handle your blade, your knife. I tend to use a belt knife when I'm cutting blocks. Um, just for example, you've seen us use like potato knives and things like that. This is a belt knife, by the way. This was sent to me by a fan. Um, a big, just big surprise. Just came in the mail. So thank you, Michael B. This thing is freaking amazing. Uh, I hope you enjoy the strain I sent you. I just hope that it's, uh, you know, no one else in the world has that strain except you and me, buddy. But going back to it, when I am using, <clears throat> um, look at that walnut burl. I just, I'm in freaking love with this knife. Um, <laughs> I'll really cut into a block. Uh, I'll cut deep with this blade. So I will need to treat this blade, and oftentimes what I will do, which, I mean, I'm not, I don't use this knife for cutting blocks, I'm just using this as an example. I have a specific belt knife that I use for mushroom work uh, that I had custom made, but um, I will alcohol the entire blade down, and I will really rub it to make sure that I have, um, you know, it's called rubbing alcohol for a reason. It becomes more effective when you rub, when you put the alcohol in there, rub it. It helps to rupture the cell walls. Then you stab your block, but we also put alcohol on the outside of our blocks to help when we cut, just to keep bacteria down. I don't want to plant bacteria on my blocks. The good news is, folks, that bacteria is mostly a surface phenomenon. It doesn't. It lacks the power to penetrate deeply into substrates like mushrooms do. So, if, for example, this was a blotched mushroom, um, I am not going to throw this away because this is going to go in a box. We just happen to be picking it. I will set it right here. I mean, you can pick that and then start over. You just make sure you get all your little bits down. You throw them away. Um, I'll sweep that up. Or Jack will sweep it up. Whoever. Uh, anyways, you, uh, you just reset the block and let it go again. That block will produce again, even though it had blotch on it. The mushrooms should right themselves. And what's interesting is, most of the time, if you have bacterial blotch and you wipe out the mushrooms, throw them away, pick off your little pieces and let it try again, your second flush will oftentimes be as big as the first flush would have been. Maybe even slightly bigger. Uh, I don't suggest it because you have to wait longer, so I wouldn't suggest purposely doing it, but it thankfully will pay you back in spades just to take the time and go through and clean everything up. Um, <clears throat> another thing that you can do, of course, is with the torch and burn it. Um, that's not my favorite for bacteria. Mostly that's a mold thing that I, I do. Uh, just because it will help knock off the surface growth of the mold. Bacteria, like I said, it's so easy to just pick it and reset. Again, I don't really think there's much need to do other things. And really, guys, that's that's pretty much it. Like I said, quick video this time, right? Uh, but hopefully a helpful one. Uh, I've got plenty of shots through, scattered throughout the video, I hope, that... Uh, I can really show you guys what the bacterial blotch looks like so you can see it easier. Uh, oftentimes when there's bacteria um, or too much humidity in your room that will encourage bacterial growth, you will oftentimes see little warts on the caps of mushrooms, especially like things like elm and king uh, and black pearl. That is oftentimes, not always, a humidity issue but sometimes a bacteria issue that will cause those little mutations. So when you see things that look like, well, this, then you want to remove those mushrooms from your room. And you want to remove them as quickly as possible. Uh, do not remove the block unless it's nasty or time for it to go, because again, it will it should produce for you, and you can still make your money off that block. Or if you're doing this as a hobby, it will still provide mushrooms for you, your family, and that enjoyment that you're looking for. And with that, y'all, please check out our liquid cultures on our website. Uh, you can find the House Mountain Oyster on there, a brand new addition to the Mossy Creek uh, Horde, we'll call it, uh, since I played Horde in World of Warcraft rather than the Alliance. <laughs> but uh, yeah, check that oyster out. It has got such unique qualities. I don't know why I was thinking about letting it go. It's got such an interesting phenotype. 
it is well worth growing and playing with and checking out. And Samantha showed me boxes full of this thing. I cannot believe, like, its yield is incredible, and the chefs seem to be really loving it with its, its the really thin stems, but they're very well textured, very soft textured, very much like a gnocchi stems. Um, we also have a lot of great, uh, a lot of other great liquid cultures on the website. Uh, things that are doing well, if it's hot for you right now, it's hot for us as well, right? Mother of Pearl is kicking butt, uh, as is uh, BS26. Both of those strains are doing incredibly well in this heat and will do very well for you uh, in the transition to fall and winter. That's all I've got. Uh, tempted to do an outtake like the Critical Drinker, where he says, that's all I've got to say, go away now. But I've been a happy person, so we'll just go out with the traditional, shall we? Keep spawning culture, y'all. What to go and do? What to you?